Report of the Committee on Definitions of the American Philosophical Association by F. J. E. Woodbridge, Frank Thilly, Dickinson S. Miller, Arthur O. Lovejoy, W. P. Montague, and E. G. Spaulding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the members of the American Philosophical Association, your committee appointed to draw up a plan for the principal discussion at the next meeting of the association herewith presents its report. The subject of the discussion was selected from among a large number of topics suggested by members of the association by the executive committee. At the request of the latter committee, the committee on discussion has not confined itself to preparing definitions of the terms likely to be used in the debate, but has attempted to formulate somewhat precisely the issues involved and to indicate what appears to it to be, at the present juncture in philosophical discussion, the most promising mode of approach to those issues. Such an extensive attempt at an organization of cooperative philosophical inquiry has not hitherto been made by this association. Whatever proved to be the success or non-success of the enterprise in this first instance, the committee believes such organized and cooperative inquiry to have important possibilities for the future of philosophical study. It therefore ventures to express the hope that members will undertake a special effort to enter into the spirit of the undertaking, to review the recent literature of the subject, and in their participation in the discussion, to conform for the time being to the general plan of procedure herein suggested. This report is subject to later revision or supplementation. The general subject proposed is the relation of consciousness and object in sense perception. 1. Definitions. By object in this discussion shall be meant any complex of physical qualities, whether perceived or unperceived, and whether real or unreal. With respect to reality, two classes of objects are distinguishable, real and unreal. By real objects is meant in this discussion such objects as are true parts of the material world. Footnote. This definition has been drawn up in these terms in order to avoid excluding the view, held by certain English realists, that so-called hallucinatory objects are true parts of the material world. End footnote. By unreal objects is meant in this discussion such objects as are not true parts of the material world. With respect to givenness, two classes of objects are distinguishable, perceived and unperceived. By perceived object is meant in this discussion an object given in some particular actual perception. By unperceived object is meant in this discussion an object which in some particular actual perception is not given. There are thus four logically distinguishable classes of objects. 1. Real and perceived objects. 2. Real but unperceived. 3. Unreal but perceived. 4. Unreal and unperceived. By consciousness is meant in this discussion that property, relation, or whatnot by virtue of which perceived objects are logically distinguishable, though not of necessity numerically separate from unperceived objects. 2. Postulates. 1. It is assumed by the committee that all members will agree in admitting a. that there are individuated sequences or streams of perceptions, i.e. those of different persons, and b. that any definable object which is at certain times present in a given individuated sequence of perceptions may at other times be not present in this. 3. Questions for Discussion it is proposed by the committee that the discussion be devoted to the two following connected but discriminable questions. 1. What is the relation with respect to numerical identity or difference between the above defined classes of real and of perceived objects? 2. What, if it can be further defined, is the positive nature of the difference between the status of a given object at those moments when it figures in some particular individuated stream of perception? and its status at those moments when it does not figure in that same stream. In brief, what is the nature of consciousness considered as a factor or aspect of any specific perceptual situation? And how is the answer to this question logically related to the first question? 4. Analysis of the first question. With respect to the first problem, the following five views seem at least abstractly possible. 
These can be presented after the manner of formal logic as follows: a. That perceived objects are always real objects and real objects are always perceived. b. That perceived objects are always real, but real objects are not always perceived. c. That real objects are always perceived, but perceived objects are not always real. This means that the real object and the perceived object are, at the moment of perception, numerically one, and that the real object cannot exist at other moments independently of any perception. Epistemological monism and idealism. Footnote. The term idealism is used throughout in its epistemological sense, i.e. to denote the theory of subjectivism opposed to realism. It should not be confused with ontological idealism, i.e. the theory opposed to materialism. End footnote. D. That perceived objects and real objects are never the same, though the former may be representative of the latter. This means that the perceived object and the real object are at the moment of perception numerically two, and that the real object can exist at other moments independently of any perception. Epistemological dualism and realism. E that perceived objects are sometimes real and sometimes not real, and real objects are sometimes perceived and sometimes not perceived, which here signifies not given in any actual perception. This means that the real object and the perceived object are at the moment of perception numerically one, and that the real object may exist at other moments apart from any perception. Epistemological monism and realism. The committee recognizes that it is in connection with these five views that the main controversy relating to the first question arises. But inasmuch as the first two of the five logically possible positions are alone in affirming the reality of all perceived objects, whether hallucinatory or not, and inasmuch as recent discussion has concerned itself with the status of real objects, in the special sense of non-hallucinatory objects, the committee deems it wise to restrict the discussion to the consideration of the last three of the five possible positions. To this end, the committee presents the following and more specific formulation of the question at issue. In cases where a real and non-hallucinatory object is involved, what is the relation between the real and the perceived object with respect a to their numerical identity at the moment of perception? B with respect to the possibility of the existence of the real object at other moments apart from any perception. 5. Analysis of the second question. With respect to the second question, that as to the nature of consciousness, there is a great diversity of opinion. The committee has attempted a compilation and concise formulation of some of the recent accounts of consciousness, insofar as consciousness is involved in perception. The results are presented here in the hope that they may serve as a basis for discussion and a point of departure, but it should be clearly understood that these formulations have in some instances not been submitted for ratification to the philosophers to whom they are ascribed, and that consequently the latter should not be held responsible for them. The formulas which follow, it should be understood, are not verbal definitions, but statements of what different writers regard as constituting that by virtue of which a perceived object differs from an unperceived object. It should be further understood that the several formulas are not in all cases reciprocally exclusive, and that in the opinion of some a complete characterization of consciousness as a factor in the perceptual situation might require the combination of several of these formulas. Numbers in parentheses refer to the corresponding titles in the appended bibliography. 1. Consciousness is the response made by one entity to another in a specific manner exhibited by the reflex nervous system, the response being one which does not directly modify the entities responded to otherwise than to endow them for the time being with this content status. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to justify epistemological monism and realism. 2. Consciousness is the virtual or potential presence of an object at a place or time in which it is not actually present. Many objects can be virtually present in one organism, and one object can be virtually present in many organisms. The objects, whether real or unreal, that are thus virtually present or perceived, depend in no way upon the perceiver or upon the mechanism of perception. 
though the selective action of the mechanism of perception does determine at each moment which objects, real or unreal, shall be perceived. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to imply the truth of epistemological monism and realism. 3. Consciousness is the instrumental activity of an organism with respect to a problematic or potential object. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to imply the artificiality of the first question, and accordingly of its several answers. 4. Consciousness is a certain external relation between objects, that of meaning. For an object to be in consciousness means for it, the object, to imply some other object or objects. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to render admissible epistemological monism and realism. 5. Consciousness is a certain external relation between objects, namely that relation which obtains between them insofar as they enter the context of a single personal biography. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to render admissible epistemological monism and realism. 6. Consciousness consists essentially of conations. These are not merely attributes of consciousness, but are what and what alone is directly experienced as consciousness. They are directed towards objects, but perceived objects are in consciousness only in the sense that they are attended to and pointed at by some individual conation sequence. The objects themselves are never mental, i.e. composed of or mediated through consciousness, but are purely physical. Thus consciousness at any moment of perception is a given element in the perceptual situation distinct from objects or content, but the objects are not represented in or modified by consciousness. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to justify both epistemological monism and realism. 7. In normal perception, consciousness is a perfectly transparent mental process i.e. a process which relates to objects and involves them for the time being in a special context, but does not thereby either ground their existence or modify their character. In abnormal perception, dreams, hallucinations, illusions, consciousness is not a transparent mental process, but one in which the content as well as the activity is mental, the object therein having its presence and character wholly or partly determined by special modifications or abnormalities in the physiological mechanism of perception. Thus the nature of consciousness in normal perception is such as to render admissible both realism and epistemological monism. 8. Consciousness is a unique and not further analyzable relation of togetherness, which obtains among all the objects given in the momentary, individuated, and limited field of any particular perception. From the exclusive and individual character of the field in which this relation at any given moment subsists, it follows that an object given in one field cannot be numerically identical with any object not at that moment in that relation within the same field. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to render inadmissible the combination of realism and epistemological monism. 9. Consciousness consists of those existences whose being is identical with their seeming, it is a being which knows in what state it is and is always precisely such as it knows itself to be. Fechner, Uber die Seelenfrage, page 199. But since the being and nature of real objects are always conceivably different from their seeming, the nature of consciousness is such as to render inadmissible the combination of realism and epistemological monism. 10. Consciousness is that medium or mode of subsistence of objects, which, among other attributes, makes hallucinations, dreams, and perceptual errors possible, i.e. the medium in which can exist a spatial object not at the same time existent in the real space of normal percipients. This reveals a specific type of case in which the existence of an object in consciousness is not identical with any relation among real objects. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to render inadmissible the combination of realism and epistemological monism. 11. Consciousness is that which exists in time but not in space. As given in consciousness, therefore, objects, though they may be represented as having spatial attributes, are not existent in space, and consequently they cannot be numerically identical with any supposed objects existing in space. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to render inadmissible the combination of realism and epistemological monism. 12. Consciousness is psychic existence as such, and does not necessarily involve awareness, 
which is only a special type of psychic existence. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to imply epistemological monism and idealism. 13. Consciousness is a sensory manifold, unified through its conjunction with some single coherent purpose or interest. This conscious unity of feeling, determined by the reference to a unique interest, is the only example to which we can point when we desire to show how relatedness is possible, and how it is conceivable that what is many should at the same time be one. But objects are necessarily conceived as possessing relations. Thus the nature of consciousness is such as to necessitate the acceptance of epistemological monism and idealism. End of Report of the Committee on Definitions of the American Philosophical Association by F. J. E. Woodbridge, Frank Philly, Dickinson S. Miller, Arthur O. Lovejoy, W. P. Montague, and E. G. Spaulding.